So I wanted um, to give you all an extra treat, and since we're in the realm of mothers, I asked um, Asha to read for us one of my favorite of her poems. My mother was a freedom fi fighter from her new book, My Mother the Freedom Fighter. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it, so thank you to Ed Weech for asking. Um, something we'll talk about later is uh, a bit, of, a bit of, we'll touch a little bit on our mothers. Um, but this poem is started as a, something that was about my personal relationship to my mother and became a larger conversation about all mothers. Um, and so it's called, My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter. She testifies a night song on the woolly back of a mammoth. Shadow boxing rivulets, a mother's cow falls to her feet. A fist in the pouch of a honey-hipped negra hill towering over the country. The farmers of plantations made of motels and mansions, nurse of hospitals and camps, shamans in huts walking to work in dawn fog. With heretic hands, a chupacabra suffering in solos, or a black unicorn refugee panhandling at the border of an upside down dimension. Beguiled by bars, bearing the burden of crimes of love, cold sweat, gloom, despair, almonds. Denied a passport to mercy, a citadel of judgment. She was born in the bulwark of bordellos and brothels, Poor women least love in pawn shops shaped as men, traversing the sins of them. Unyielding wind blows her back into dirt roads and waves dimly seen, singed at the stakes or drowned at sea. She studies the way of water and gills, a mermaid. She is an archipelago of shanty towns. She is invention and necessity, found scraps, a bouquet of bloody music in her hands, cane of sugar, leaves of tobacco, a cluster of bananas, coffee beans, the husk of corn, a poppy seed, tea shrubs, spikelet of wheat, rice flour, gold nuggets, diamonds, and coltan. She is an incantation bellowing from the fields and mines. Look for her in the ruins, at the funeral procession, drunk off palm wine, screaming in a traffic of, of arms, lonely but not alone. On the shores of Gore, she pinched yam and okra seeds in her baby's hair, carrying the wrath of their stories for when the fowls come home to roost. Enduring tides of licks and whips, she wept by a mangrove and carved a spear from her lover's bones. Spitting on her thumb, she smeared shame from her children's cheeks, blessed in esteem. Blighted dreams born of zealous sires laying with her in a stretch of orchids, honeysuckles, daffodils, cotton blooming, or splayed on a cot during a conjugal visit. Switchblade in her boot, straw hat sitting on her braids, she touches herself moaning. Pleasure pours gently on her. She was captured in the middle of a gunfight in broad daylight, muzzled by averted ears, smarmy smiles, and what befell their humanity. If ever a drought, gray clouds gather on one accord and rally above her for seasons. Further than the choice of children, she is beyond what names her courage. She arrived, quarreled by instinct, a petition for presence. It was a woman who nannied neglect in maroon parishes, hooting and hollering. She midwife revolutions in rainforests, Amazons, and cities. Sediments of her sorrow beseeching because the eye of the storm within her they called her magic. Merely more, she was a freedom fighter, and she taught all of us how to fight. <laughs> Thank you, Edwidge. So I have some questions. I have a few. I guess since we're talking about mothers, I do have a, a question that touches on that. Um, and, in contrast to, to my mother, um, your mother, she seems, in, in some of the, the, the writing in which you talk about her, she seems, I, I recall you talking about how she always gives a book to people um, <laughs> and in an effort to show her, her pride and her, um, her joy in raising you, um, and that she's constantly hustling your books for admiration. <laughs> um, 
And although I would never endeavor to write anything embarrassing for the sake of my mother's image, um, there's so much trauma and pain. And we talk a lot about um, the mother wound and the things that we carry that our mothers have and that get you know, passed on to us. And there's a lot of shame around this. And so it's, you're, you're, not, you're not open to, to really talking about it in public. And it made me think of when I was reading about your, your mom, it made me think about that cartoon, um, I don't know if y'all have seen it, that shows the, the parents at their daughter's book signing. And it says, uh, had I known you'd grow up to be a writer, I, I would have treated you better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, and since my relationship with my, with my mom is still like a very sore spot and tender, uh, I wanted to ask you, were there ever things that you were hesitant to share and frightened that it caused pain for others to witness in your family, that there were reflections in your words that they, they may not be able to face? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there are things that I, um, I had a writer friend who keeps saying, like, you're going to write about your mother? She's like, I have so many stories, but I have to wait. She's like, I have to wait for her mom to pass on. So um, <laughs> my, my parents, part of it, I don't think they fully read my books. My mom just read my first book. She read Breath Eyes Memory and the French translation. And then the only thing she said about it, she's like, people are going to think you're not a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> because it was like all the stuff with the sex and the thing. So that was her, her, her critique, and then I think she stopped, but then she would follow. So for Creek Crack, there's a mom in, the, in one of the stories who plays the lotto. She says, well, you know, um, everybody in church thinks we play the lotto now because of you. Uh, so the responses would be like that. But I think she realized, so when my mom had cancer, my dad had a terminal illness too. When we were going to the doctor, both her and my father would say, bring the book for your doctor, bring your book to your doctor. Mm -hmm. So, and I was so embarrassing because you're just like, it's, and then you're like a five-year-old giving the doctor your book that they'll never read because you never hear about it again. Yeah. So I think they realized sort of what the cultural currency the book was really, like they were hoping that it would get them treated better. better. <laughs> I don't think they cared if like, no matter what was in it, I think it was like, it's a book, this is my daughter, but on the other hand, too, it's like watching now both my parents like suffer through very uh, hard illnesses towards the end is that there's a, so much of you get stripped away, mm. like just in daily life and people lose a lot of agency. And so you kind of want the doctor to see you as a special person. And I yeah. think that's that, what that was also about because there's a lot of things in my books that I think if my parents, it's kind of like when they're, when they tell me, like, like have a preacher friend invite me to their church to speak, I'm like, you sure? <laughs> They're like, yes, Pastor Swinton wants you to come speak at it. She was like, tell him to read the books first, <laughs> you know? So, but I think for them, it was just like the book. It, was, it, was, it didn't even matter what, what was what, in it. What was in it, yeah. Well, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, there's, there's a few questions I have about um, essentially, so for, for example, with my family, we're Cuban and Jamaican, and I didn't grow up in any of those countries. I had to go back and discover a lot. And I think that there's a very specific relationship to the islands and the Caribbean in, in regards to when you grow up somewhere and when you've lived there versus when you hear the stories of what it used to be like to grow up there or to live there. And I wanted to know what was your experience in the conversation with Haitian Americans um, who grew up here versus the relationship to Haitians on the island and your work? Has there been any different reception? Um, and do you feel like there's writers who, the di the, that the diaspora is writing in a way that they weren't writing before? about you know being from the Caribbean now? Yeah, I think that's a very that's a question. It's like literary immigrant communities. There's always this conversation about like the writers inside and the writers outside. You know, yeah. one of the best descriptions of it I read is Julia Alvarez has an essay um, in in a book of essays called Something to Declare, 
where she mm. talks about going to the Dominican Republic to a big literary festival and like the grand dame of Dominican letters said to her like, stop writing in English, come back to your country and write the real stuff. And then so she wrote this essay like with your permission and she writes about this sort of unique uh, situation where she describes as living on the hyphen. Mm. So I think this inside outside exists in all, you know, my, in all these communities, like who is the authenticity, right? And, but for writers in the diaspora in the, in the United States, it's complicated by language. So yeah. is it, it's like if you're writing in English and the official languages of Haiti are French and Creole, it, does that make you a Haitian writer? Right, so there was, when, um, when my book was first published in the 90s, um, there's one other writer, and, and Dadesky, who had written a novel in English. So people were like, where did this fit? I would go to conferences in Haiti, and like, is she a Haitian writer, is she not? Mm. I think that's that people now, you know, you have writers who, people who are talking about Haitian literature inside Haiti who will say, the more generous ones will say like, Haitian literature is now produced in four languages, French, Creole, Spanish, in English, because we have writers writing in those languages. But I think there's still that tug or sort of like, and also my age, when Breath Eyes Memories, I was 24, so people would be like, just like they do in the- Give it up for that, <laughs> 24. That was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, even in like family conversation, you're like the little girl in, in your family. They're like, where do you know? My mother would be like, how do you know this stuff? You know, and so, um, so I think there was that, that tension. But now there's so many more young people coming. But I felt like, this is why, I started editing these anthologies, like Haiti, I'm plugging the Akashic series. I'm sure there's a Santa Fe Noir because there's like every city in America has its Noir from Akashic yes. books. <laughs> so then they did Haiti Noir and Haiti Noir 2 to like put together those like in translation to bring these writers. Also, I think in America too, like the literary culture in America is that they, that they pick a person and they're like, you're the Run Haitian writer. Yeah. You're, the, you're the Dominican writer. You're this writer. You're this writer from this thing. And then they sort of, and it's not that the person is knighting themselves, the writer from that place, but it's like they write about that person. And I've always really wanted to resist that with, and, but not just with um, trying to, you know, anthologize and, and, and being together with other writers in the diaspora, but also bringing the writers from Haiti and see like, because Haiti has a, an extraordinary, literary uh, history and, and also. Yeah. Um, well, I have a few questions here, y'all. In America, um, our movement right now, just bringing it home, like there's a, um, we talk a lot about, especially since your last book is the, it's called The Art of Death and thinking about how our movement surrounds, uh, is, feels surrounded by death. Um, and we've stated Oftentimes in community organizing spaces, we talk a lot about a numbness and a silence in the morning, and there's a depression that overcomes um, you are, uh, around death. And you know, this, this, it's one thing to lose someone and know that you're losing them in hospice and you kind of have a little bit more of time to process it. It's another thing to kind of suddenly deal with uh, death and death no longer is just your solitude experience with this person, your only solo relationship, but it becomes a community is mourning, an entire nation mourns. Um, and I wanted to know, this is a two-part question. Have you ever been startled by your own numbness to death? Um, and then this is also something that you said in what the, early, the first story that you read about freedom, dying was a sort of freedom or something like that, one of the, the character. And I wanted to ask, in light of death and the conversation around death, sometimes death feels like the only place we can be free. Mm. Um, mm. And so I wanted to know, what is freedom to you? And do you feel like, you know, you're fa I've seen you talk a lot about, um, you know, the way that, that death shows up consistently in your work. And so do you feel like that's a place where you can explore a, a, a freedom or um, a, a way of expressing yourself that you can't in talking about life? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, in our, in our tradition, like in African diaspora tradition, yeah. too, it's like death is certainly not the, the end, end. Yeah. right? And, and it's very interesting that you asked this question. I remember when um, my mom had just passed away and I had to do this, this event in Chicago 
and um, and I went and and I was just going to talk about this book and and there were so many people in the audience who was, who basically they stood up and says you know your personal grief is fine but there were five murders this past weekend of children and what do you do with that and then it really sort of gave gave me pause and then you sort of navigate the space and you're like well um, this, this, this notion of community grief, which is also in, in our tradition, is that when, if, you know, just like in Haiti, like here, I was always startled when people said, oh, so and so, I'm not invited to the funeral, right? Like, in our communities, it's like, who, nobody's invited to a funeral. Yeah. Like, it's just like, <laughs> you know. it's, a, it's like a communi community event. Like, we all take on this grief, right? And so, I think it's to, one way in that particular situation, in that particular moment, it was, it was I, I started thinking, how do we take sort of like, how do we think about that deep personal loss, like that hole we feel in our hearts, and how do we transfer that as a community event, so, mm -hmm. that, so that it's just like, oh, another child died, another person was shot, so that's like, each one is an event, because when the person is very close to you, it's an event, it's time. I don't allow myself to become numb to death. Obviously, I've lost a lot of people close to me, and I think in one of your poems, you talk about like death is a relative you never thought you had, mm -hmm. and to each one of us, it's always it's always new. But how do we, as a community, do that? You know, and and I've seen it like, for example, in um, in Miami, that when when people were more coming by the boat, when the bodies were washing, the community sometimes would go on the radio you know, and fundraise so they could have a funeral for someone whose body has washed up. And there was, this, there was one, like the last funeral I went to was this one young woman who got on the boat. Her family didn't even know she was coming. She had a young man she was in love with in Miami and she got on the boat. And then her body, you know, like washed up and then her family couldn't come because of course they wouldn't give them visa. And the community got together and buried her. They had a, mm. they gave her a send off but it was also a sense of a, like a, a moment for us all to grieve um, together the situation, the person, the individual, but also the situation, the conditions that led her to make that choice, the conditions that led that young man to, to come there. So I think if it's just carrying, that's the lesson from that, that encounter that day, I felt like just how do we transfer that sense of what it feels like for us to lose someone, mm. to like when that my, your neighbor loses someone, and and when the community like when when a child is dies senselessly, we all lose, and that yeah. to take on the burden of that. So I mean, in terms of freedom, I don't. I mean, we have that in our history. You know, when I was writing that story, I thought of of Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, where it mm -hmm. says, "If you if you surrender to the air, you can write it." I think we've always had ways in our traditions to find, to find our freedom and so like this continuity that life is and that death certainly doesn't stop. It's just like a stage to go through. But I don't think we also should romanticize brutal deaths. No. You know. um, I wanted to think, uh, in, actually in an article you penned for the Miami Herald in response to Trump's horrible, mischaracterization of Haiti, um, you stress the importance of mourning and um, trying to mourn and the many ways that we also must fight back. And I think you, you conjured up the saying, like, today we mourn, tomorrow we fight. Um, is it ever too much to mourn or too much to fight? Like, is fighting to you maybe some sort of mourning? Um, or a celebration, or do you think that you can get paralyzed by trying to balance the two? Because I find that often in community, you know, like the mothers of the, quote unquote, the mothers of the movement, the mothers who have lost their children, uh, as soon as they lose their children, they just are, you know, catapulted into this whole movement and mm -hmm. they hit the ground running, trying to gain justice for their children. And so there's yeah. really no time to mourn. To mourn. Um, and I remember there's a, uh, forgetting the name of the author, but there's a book um, of, a, of a, a Chinese writer who talks about 
the, these women who, went, who fought, who basically decided to mourning was a protest, that the ability mm -hmm. to mourn was a protest oh, yeah. in public. And I think about in that. Argentina, the, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I think about that as, as in light of the fact that you brought up, you know, today we mourn, tomorrow we fight, but I, I feel like there's this constant battle for black people, but specifically people of the diaspora and immigrant communities, those who are, are most marginalized right now, to be in this like balance between mourning yeah. and fighting. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering like, what is the, where is the moment where we ask others to come up and fight mm -hmm. so that we can just mourn? Yeah, I mean, and I feel like, especially with like uh, coming from a place like Haiti, and that's something I've always felt like we've never really had an opportunity to mourn certain things, you know, like you go from the dictatorship then to the coup, then to the earthquake. And so, but I think what's important to remember, and you know this because you were daily working um, in the community um, with incarcerated people, with, you know, uh, the thing is that we have to remember that we all can fight in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and sometimes the, the reverse of that is that there are people who are like, oh my God, I don't have that personality to, to, to like, I don't have the personality of the chaining myself to something. I don't have the personality, or I don't have the time, I have small children, I have time, but that we all, like, we can all do it in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like writers can write, or artists can do it, like, you know, we, for example, with the case of the temporary protected status, um, there, bus, there, was, there were a group of people who were going across the country because they were, they had, they were losing their, temp, their protected status and they were going to be deported, and there were grandmothers on the bus, they were students, they were barbers, they were, you know, who were doing that 60 days, and maybe you can't do that, you can meet them, but I think we have to allow ourselves, definitely, you know, the self-care is, is certainly, a catchphrase, but um, allow yourself the space and do what do what you can, but not feel like you have to take up the whole thing. And um, and other, you know, certainly it's it's not something that that the people who are suffering the most, and sometimes they can't, like the children on the border, are children. They can't do this on their own, and their families cannot do it on their own. You know, I had uh, a very close experience with it when my uncle died in immigration custody. My uncle, who was 84 years old, was uh, coming from Haiti, uh, had his medicine taken away, was like, died shackled to a hospital bed in mm -hmm. the prison ward of Jackson Memorial in Miami. And so I was pregnant with my daughter at that time, and suddenly I understand that desire to fight because you're like, you. You want, you want to fight because something has happened, but you also have to, you know, at that point, it's a very singular and specific example, it's like my own, but I had to kind of let others pick me up sometimes too. Mm. And I think we have to think of this, not just, you know, this fight is not just say, through the next four years or through the next however long period, it's, a, it's an eternal fight on some level. Yeah. But just we have to trust, we have to also train up younger people to take it up. Um, just as you're doing with your work. Well, it's, it's interesting you said that because I think for myself, I'm finding, trying to find always the balance between time for writing and time to create and then the community stuff that we, you know, for those of you who don't know, we, um, we live in Miami and Little Haiti and there's a lot of work. It's nonstop <laughs> work that needs to be done around displacement, evictions, there's temporary protection status is, was about to be up. For those of you who don't know what temporary protection status is, the government grants temporary protection for folks who are immigrants from you know, really um, horrible conditions and flee from their country. And um, uh, the Haitian community in Miami is, is most vulnerable right now. Um, and so we work with um, Community Justice Project and Family Action Network movement <laughs> uh, in in Miami, and um, a bunch of other. There's so many things that I'm that I'm constantly balancing, and I think that the the reason why I asked that question is because as I as necessary as I believe writing um, is and art is at times, I'm in the heart of, you know, we're in the heart of Art Basel, Miami, which has become 
a colonial project. It is like exploited art to no end. And <laughs> uh, it's really true. I mean, art has been used very, it's weaponized. It's, it's, it's actually pretty horrendous what's happening in the ways in which art has become a transactional commodification of you know, displacing people and developers as they all do um, across the country are bringing artists in, beautifying the neighborhood, turn, flipping over uh, communities. There's no conversation about what's happening in those, um, to the people who are, who are most vulnerable and who live there and who've been living there. And you know, the thing we always say is we're not against development, we're against displacement. Mm -hmm. And this has become such an urgent thing. It's such an urgent moment in time that sometimes writing feels like it's not urgent enough, it's not immediate enough, mm -hmm, it's not mm -hmm. going to change the material conditions of people. And I think about you know, people f facing uh, evictions. Um, we started a thing called Poetry for the People where we, inspired by June Jordan, we're using poetry to try to help amplify the stories of the, of the people that Marlene um, Bastian is working with, who is from FAM. And I start wondering if you know, poems alone can transform the conditions of our community, right? I mean, we know that it cannot, but there's a time where you get tired and there's a time where all I wanna do is just hand Marlene a pen and say, <laughs> yeah. pour it, pour out, show me where it hurts. There yeah. might be something in this for you. There might be something you can gain from this. But that sounds like a ridiculous thing to ask her to do. You know, mm -hmm. if you know Marlene, yeah. she's this powerhouse activist and community organizer and just asking her to sit down and take some time for herself. I know so many community organizers who are sick in despair, depression, some who have killed themselves. Um, and I, I get what you say about self-care, but I, I continue to push on, is it too much to ask for others to, to pick up the baton while we, while we rest? You know, mm -hmm. and, what, and what does that look like? What does it look like as writers who have people listening and reading to help us take on this fight so that we're not doing it alone, you know? Um, I don't, I, that's a lot. <laughs> and it's, it's, I think it's a thing that even coming from, um, I, like I've felt as a writer my whole life, coming from a poor family where while I'm writing, there's like, there's so on. much happening even within your family. I think that um, guilt is always there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think at the same time, we can also honor the unique thing that you contribute to, right? Which is your word, which is your art. And I think um, what I, what, the way I think of it is what uh, I think of James, James Baldwin talks about being a witness. Hmm. And he wasn't just a witness from afar, right? He was a witness from up close. But um, we know certain things because he was there and he documented through his art and he forced us to look up close. Um, so I, I know that, that there are moments where you're like, oh my gosh, I, I know, writing this, I, I'm writing this essay while well, there's been an earthquake, while well, people, you know, I think, um, it's asking a lot and it's not taking the burden of like that, that the rest is not gonna happen when you're balancing all of those things. I, um, but I think we can do it because I think we come from people who have had to do it. I had no choice. And who have had to do more, right? And um, I keep going back to uh, us workers in search of our mother's gardens mm -hmm. where, she, where she talks about um, there were these women who were artists but they didn't, they weren't even they didn't able even to practice that. their art. Yeah. Yes. And then they found ways to do it with their quilting, with their gardens. And I think to that, we can act in the time that we're living now with our, with our actions in the community, with our citizenship, with our activism. But I would, um, it would break my heart to lose the artist in Ejean Monet. Like I love the activist, but I also love the artist in you. So I think, I think, we used to have to find ways to kind of get both of those people to walk together. Mm. And, and, and I've been trying for 25 years and, 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 um, and I'm not willing to let go of either one. Mm. That's beautiful. Um.
I appreciate it because it's it's not often when you're in those worlds, you know, they are they are made to seem as if they're separate, mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes you're trying to tell the organizers you need art, you need poetry, yeah. you need writing, and you're trying to tell the writers and the poets, you know, you need organizers, you need community, you know. So it's I know, yeah. I've had like I have a really good friend who once, you know, once you could always count like I I actually appreciate things like that. She said, you know, you write pretty well, but that's not going to feed anybody. <laughs> so I was like, Hum well, humility, right? Yes, you always exactly. have the, the people so around you like, to ground well, you. Then we have to find some other way to, you know, to, um, to do both. I want to ask two more questions. Um, I was thinking about, there was something I read um, when I was looking over your work that brought up this thought around, I think it was um, with breath, Lucille Clifton was quoting another writer when she talked about how black children need windows as well as mirrors. Mm -hmm. And I find that in today's society, we're obsessed with mirrors. Um, we're obsessed with sameness as a way of affirmation in many ways. And social media and the culture of just, you know, the, the, the contemporary culture that we're in is all about seeing yourself, representation. Um, and identity and that they're, you know, though important has not offered us the ability to reinvent or reimagine our worlds. Do you ever fear that though we may be representations that we're not offering enough revelations in the writing world about um, the depth beyond and because of identity, how identity shapes us, but also how we need more windows and conversations that aren't just about how identical we are, how same we are, but to celebrate um, the, dif the difference. And when I say that, I'm talking less about white folks reading our work or other cultures, but I'm talking about the range of even blackness. Like we, we haven't um, allowed for, you know, because of the mainstream literary and media and everything, there has not been a lot of range for depth of many cultures. Mm -hmm. And so, I think there's a pain and a longing for connection that our, our young people are feeling, and there's an insecurity, and so that's why we're longing for mirrors. We're longing for people that look like us, that sound like us. Um, but I wanted to ask you, in what ways do you look for windows, and how do you try to create more windows? I think the diaspora helps offer that for black Americans, and I think there's a lot for, for us to learn from the diaspora in, you know, in terms of the Caribbean, but also at large. So. Well, I mean, I think one of the, the ways, like, so when I was 15 and reading, I remember reading My Angelus, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, and it just blew the top of my head off. And I thought, oh my God, she shared all of that and is still walking around and, you know. So I think one of the ways, I think they're, they're the books, I, I find it even my, in my own family, is we just need kind of like what you were talking about portals, we need guides to bring our young people to these books. Mm. First of all, we need them to read, right? Because I think, especially for young black girls, right, if you're, if this is always, you're always on the screen and you're sort of looking at these, some images that are so far from who you are. Yep, superficial. And then exactly what pops up is not gonna be June Jordan or Audrey Lord right away. But, um, but I think if we can like find guides to these, I think, the, I think the, the, these models exist. There's certainly more, there was no Jacqueline Woodson. There was, there was no, you know, there was Entezaki and I just like ate it up. Mm -hmm. But someone had to guide me to, to Zora to her, Hurston, yeah. to her. So I think that's also one way to like, you have this breadth of like, of representations of these people who look like you, who have produced wonderful things. I think that's what we have to lead them to, like to, 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 to find that. Cause that was so extraordinarily valuable to me to, you know, and I thought, you know, we couldn't have had, like Maya Angelou uh, grew up with her grandma in Arkansas. And I thought, oh, that's just like me growing up with my aunt and uncle in Haiti and the back and forth and certain painful things that happened to her and that had also happened to me. And so you can find a home in books. I think we just have to, first of all, raise that value yeah. of just showing um, young people the value 
of finding those books. And, and sometimes all it takes is one book that you completely fall in love with, and then you fall in love with, I, I don't want to say all books, <laughs> but some other books that then you go on, on a journey. But I think we need to just like keep emphasizing the, the, the power of that because it was important for both you and me, right? To, and I think on the road to becoming a writer, you are first a reader. For sure. So these next questions have nothing to do with either of those things. I wanted to know, what is one of the silliest, most embarrassing things that you do? Oh my God. Ask my children, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> What's the silliest, most embarrassing thing? Singing, I try. <laughs> You love to sing. I love to sing, but I can't sing. <laughs> is there an art, uh, is there a creative passion or thing that you love to do that has nothing to do with writing that helps inform your writing? Um, I, you know, people used to ask me, what's your hobby? I would say writing. <laughs> what's your job? Writing. <laughs> I didn't have a, I, did, I, I don't, still don't think I have a, a hobby. I, I, um, I love looking at visual arts. Like I love um, just like, and I love finding the rituals in that, mm. right? Because we, um, the way in which sort of certain objects are sacred and then they slip into the mundane and, and how does that come out of somebody's head? Mm. That, still, that still blows me away. Like if I could start over, I would also Paint, for example. I know people would say it's not too late. But it's not. <laughs> but I feel like that would be, I would be a singing painter. <laughs> nice. That I would could, be really so. I could see it. You know, I think as you get older, as women, I, I hear, you get more confident. This is I hear. <laughs> you know? Uh, mm. and, and you get less, you just, I feel, you start to care less what yeah. people think, so you, you're just gonna start belting and singing. Maya Angelou used to do it all the time. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. Um, but as you get older, you also have less time, so you prioritize. <laughs> you can sing while you're driving, mm, while you're taking true. your kids to the grocery store. Or at your reading. I don't Santa sure. Fe. Not sure if they would love it, but. Um, and then. The last thing I wanted to ask about, because I know we all deal with um, mourning in our own way, what is, what brings you joy? What are things mm. that, um, I know of course you mentioned the visual art, but what are things that you try to create more space for? And do you find your mother and father visiting you in those moments? Are there moments where you feel like they come to say hello? Oh yeah, my, I used to be very jealous of my brother after my, my um, father passed away, he would say, I dreamed about Papa today. And I'm like, oh, I, I, don't, I don't dream much about my father, but I oh, think it's cool because <clears throat> he, you know, and my family, they thought I was so afraid of everything. And I think my father was probably like, I'm not gonna scare her from the afterlife. <laughs> but, um, but my mom, every once in a while comes, I think, to visit me. And the last really sweet dream, I, my mother's name was Rose, and she came and I, you mentioned Lucille Clifton. One of my favorite things um, of her is that someone g gave me a book of Lucille Clifton's poetry after my mom passed away, and she had, there's a poem in there, Oh, and to God, oh, and to God, give, me to give back to me my mother in her 30s. Mm. And then I, I had read that so many times, and then my mother came to me in her 30s in like this beautiful pink coat. And, and people actually, used to, I used to show people pictures of my mother, then they thought she was me. Wow. And she came kind of looking like that, looking really fabulous. And I thought, I thought, I finally get my visit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, so, because you said that, there was a question I had about dreams. Um, so, you talk about a dream, I, I saw you, uh, when you talked, you talked about a dream where you wake up and you shaking and, and feeling like you abandoned your mother and you're panicking. Um, and eventually you realize it's not, not her. I wanted to know what role dreams played in your writing process, and if you see your writing as all, at all as, as an offering or some sort of altar uh, to loved ones or to people that you're writing about. Oh, I mean, I, I think you've stated too in your, in your work there, and, and that's probably why 
even in that dilemma between the activism and the work, you, the work will always be there because there are moments where you're kind of like a vessel mm. for it because the, and a lot of that comes through, I get a lot of story ideas through, through dreams and even through like, sort of like, even if you don't remember the dream, kind of like that feeling of the dream. Of the dream. And, dream um, residue. Yes. Oh, I didn't know it had a name. I just, I don't know, it just, uh, came, up, it just came to me. <laughs> but I think it always reminds me, I mean, I think I find dreams in a way are very parallel to creativity because first of all, they remind you that there's just something bigger happening mm. in the universe that, that you sort of, and I think that you're always trying to tap. And I think um, art is like that, certainly writing is like that, where you, you start out with sort of a vague notion and you try to go deeper. And the writing itself, the art, is a, is a kind of dream, you know, that, that, um, that you hope you emerge from with something beautiful and wonderful mm. and, and, and at least helpful to others as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, Edwidge. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you to Lannon and... Um, I believe we'll be signing books outside, so if you'd like to please come, get your books and get signed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.